Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle, medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Everybody, Dr. Dad's coming at you again. We have a really important topic and a heartfelt message that needs to be heard today and this one hits really close uh, to home for me and uh, really excited to roll this one out. Dr. Nick, what's happening man? Good buddy, just uh, yeah again just to mirror what you're saying when it comes to conversations about our kids you know these are these are ones my ears just perk right up it's just so so important uh, especially in the world that we're living in so take it away buddy. So we've been blessed to get to interview uh, an author. His name is Reed Forgrave, and he wrote a book called Love Zach, Small Town Football and the Life and Death of an American Boy. So, you know, I played college football. I played sports all the way through college football, had a lot of concussive trauma. And so, you know, this is a very important topic that I was just talking with Reed about. We need to have a light uh, shown on this. This is important. I feel like ever since this movie that came out a while back, uh, the, the movie Concussion with Will Smith, there was a, a lot of attention being put there. And then I feel like it's kind of blown over a little bit since then. So I'm really excited to talk about this because very important things need to be kind of expressed and really just more knowledge for people to make better decisions about whether or not I think football is a good choice for their children. You know, that's one thing I think even with me and Diego, I'm not so sure I'm going to let him play football now. And so it's just a conversation, right? We need to, we need to go down this road. So I'll try to hold back the tears, man, because this one's, this one's big. So a little bit about the author real quick. So Reed, uh, he writes about sports and other topics for magazines and publications like GQ, GQ the New York Times, Mother Jones. Um, he has covered the NFL and college football for FoxSports.com and CBS Sports. And he currently writes for the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. Uh, the article in which he first wrote about Zach Easter is included in the Best American Sports Writing 2018. Uh, a past life found him working at the Des Moines Register in Iowa, where he wrote long-form narrative journalism and covered the state's first in the nation presidential caucuses. Uh, Forgrave lives in Minneapolis with his wife and two sons, and Love Zach is his first book, and it is a great one. Reed, thanks for joining us, man. Hey guys, I, I appreciate you guys be, being willing to talk about this and to share this with your audience. Uh, thanks for having me on. It, it, it is such a difficult topic. And I think so often there's like a lot of you know, preaching to the choir. Like, like you can say, oh, football's bad. You can say that to people like my mom. And she'll be like, oh yeah, I hate football anyway. It, it's more difficult when, it's, when you're talking to people who, who love football. And, and, and I, I do think this book hits at the pushes and pulls, hits at the risks and the rewards of football. I, when you tell people you wrote a book about concussions and football and CTE and suicide, people say, oh, I don't want to read that. It's going to ruin my, my view of football. Um, it's not an anti-football book. I think it's just more of a let's think deeper about this sport type of book. Well, that's what I love about the message man like football was a big thing for me growing up a lot of the successes that i have in life i found through sports and playing football so there's really no regrets for me but i love how you're saying there just needs to be a, a deeper picture of what the reality of playing this sport is and there are pros and cons and i think we we all need to just have more education and knowledge about what those cons may be and then really how to move through those things and understand if it becomes a problem, you know, maybe how to address it. So things like that happen with Zach don't happen to other kids moving forward because, you know, football is a big sport. I think it's going to stay big for a very long time. But the reality is, like you're saying, let's be real about what it is and, and, and then we can still have the love for it, but also understand the risk involved. Yeah, so I think that's a good place to start. You know, let's talk about the culture of football and, and why it's so charged and, and tell us about a little bit more about like how infused it is into the DNA of our, our American, or I'm going to say my American brothers down south and obviously it's permeating across the globe. So let's, let's start there. Yeah, I mean, when, you, when I look at football, I, I see it 
you know, baseball, they call it the American pastime, right? And I think that's probably an antiquated phrase. Uh, I think baseball has kind of slipped in America's view. But football, it's not America's pastime. It's so much more than that. It's not a pastime. It's, a, it's an obsession. You look at college towns. You look at major American cities where NFL stadiums and college football stadiums uh, are such a huge part of the infrastructure. You look down in Texas, uh, where, where one of you lives, uh, and you look at these tiny towns, and the stadiums will fill, you know, three times the population of that town. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence when you look at the growth of football. The fact that football, the first uh, football game uh, was played between two New Jersey colleges in 1869, right after the Civil War. And if you look at the growth of this sport, it mirrors the growth of America as a military and economic superpower. And I'm not even sure if the word mirrors is correct, because I think mirrors is just like reflecting something. Football is an integral part of that. You listen to like Teddy Roosevelt talking about football in the early 1900s. The sport is about to go away in 1905. Something like 36 football, college football players had died playing football in 1905. And Teddy Roosevelt says, hey, college presidents, come together at the White House. We need a commission not to eliminate football, but to make football safer and more palatable to the civilized society. Because we believe that this sport is integral to, to making the tough, strong American man. Uh, the way that football is, is so tied into the military. If you read Zach's story, uh, he was a military guy. He was in the Iowa National Guard. The doctor who, who, who did the most progressive work for him, and it was toward the end of Zach's life, did not save his life. But well, this was a doctor who was a Navy doctor who had been in charge of a concussion unit in Afghanistan. And I think it was 2010, 2011. Uh, the military was doing some like very serious concussion work at the same time. This is becoming a big deal in the NFL. So look, what is, what does football mean to America? Uh, to me, it's nothing short of like the, the ultimate, test of an American man and, and sort of what helps us turn boys into men. I know it's not the only thing. I know boys can become men in other ways. But when we talk about the ways that, uh, you know, traditional masculinity, uh, we can have those sorts of tests. We don't have, you know, half of society going to war. We don't have people proving themselves uh, living off the land. Uh, we turn to sport for a lot of that. Um, and, and to me, football is a sport that is just perfectly analogous, analogous to, to warfare. And it is a sport that, look, tough it out, right? And, and there are, we concentrate right now during this concussion crisis on the negative parts of tough it out, of rub dirt in it and take a lap. But there's something powerful in that, right? I got two young sons. I want them to tough it out. We went for a we're on, I'm on vacation right now in northern Minnesota. We went for a hike this morning. My five-year-old was whining when we we're going up some big stairs. I was like, come on, man. Be a man. Come on. Tough it out. Um, there's virtue in that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that you said that. There's there's a, a quality of stoicism that's absolutely built in to sport. And uh, football is exemplary in that, you know, uh, in that it's all about that 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 ability to defend to be uh to be strong in your offensive maneuvers and i mean and you're requiring this whole integration of a, of a team mentality that that almost is um more pivotal in that sport than than others and that you're literally depending on your 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 men around you to not let you fall and and you're preventing <laughs> you prevent you require these these other teammates to prevent you from getting severely injured you know um, they literally are protecting you so is a george football uh i'm sorry george football george orwell uh referred to sport as like war minus uh war minus the the missiles and uh football is the apotheosis of that right like if you just look at the terminology in football uh, they're going to blitz the quarterback. There's the air attack. Everything, you know, players, the linemen are playing in the trenches. So much of this is analogous to, uh, to warfare. And uh, th there is, look, every football coach is going to give you that, 
that cliche about how you have to lay lay your life on the line for your brother. Uh, he sounds like a general, but that's because there, there is so much, especially if you look back in the history of football, there's so much back and forth between the military, between the American military and high-level football. Honestly, like, it, it, who would be the best uh, general? If we could think of the best general to do traditional warfare in, a, in, in modern-day America, would you pick, like, a Colin Powell or would you pick a Bill Belichick? I'd probably pick Bill Belichick, right? Uh, I know Colin Powell understands a whole lot more about uh, the geopolitical dynamics of warfare, but as far as just like the X's and O's and figuring things out, I mean that's what that's what football coaches do. Hmm. Now you hit it right on, man. I mean, as you're talking about this whole analogous relationship between you know football and and really just war and battle. I mean, that was that was it, man. I remember growing up playing. It was always like, we're, we're going to battle. We're going to war today. And, you know, like Nick's saying, you'd have your teammates behind you and your unit. And you guys are, you guys, you guys basically have to show up for each other. And, you know, like you're saying, rub, rub some dirt on it when we have injuries or we get hurt and things like that. But, you know, in that time of my life, man, it was a very different perception of, of what was going on. And, and, and I didn't see the bigger picture. You know, when you're playing – had this incredible love and, you know, like we live and breathe football down in Texas, as, as you said, it's like in our DNA. Right. Um, but <clears throat> it's just all about the sport. It's just really all about showing up. And, and there's this intense amount of, it's hard to explain that. Like it's almost, it's just in you. And, and I remember just playing all the way through college. I just never wanted to stop playing. Even when I was done in high school and I ended up walking on, to UTEP here when I was in college and played a couple of years and but all the way through the end of my personal career just lived and breathed it man and then kind of like life went on after that and and I think I think like the the intellectual folks can sort of look down on that how can you put so much value in a sport uh and I know when I talk with with Brenda Easter that's Zach's mom a really courageous impressive woman when she looks at football she says you know she has a tortured relationship with it and she's at the point where she says my grandchildren are not playing football they can get that sort of team experience from track and field from playing basketball from playing golf And, and in my back of my mind whenever I hear her saying that I was like those are great sports and I do think that there are you know life lessons that can be learned from them are they the same as football? Uh, I'm not sure if they are. Because when you look at the, that, that sort of going into war aspect of football, there is something, you know, conquering your greatest fear. The only other sport that I think really, uh, it really has that same sort of fear conquering nature as football is combat sports, whether it's uh, mixed martial arts or boxing, where it's like once you get on the gridiron, once you step inside the ring or the octagon, it's just you and your opponent, and there's you're out there. There is something. Look, there's something absolutely destructive about it. At least there can be. There's also something that's just so powerful about it. it. Says, you know what? I could get really, really hurt on the next play. My career could end on the next play, and yet I'm going to go all out. Uh, I think there's better life lessons that can come from football than than, than any other sport. Something that you're not going to get from running the hundred meter dash. I yeah. totally, totally agree. Yeah, and I love that you bring that point up because I, it gives a reality to a conversation where we're talking about like potentially shutting down a sport or severely interfering with uh, the mode of play that people love so much. So let's talk about that because like this is this a uh, it's it's obviously ingrained into to the American culture. It's deeply and profoundly you know life changing for the people that do play uh, for better, maybe maybe more often than not, but but also for worse in many cases, like in Zach's story. So let's talk about why this is such a, a heated topic and maybe what led you into th- this discovery of Zach and 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 if you can kind of take us on a little bit of a journey there yeah well i mean let me just tell you about zach easter first uh because uh, he is look this book is about all these big topics like uh, machismo and the meaning of an american man and how we raise boys and turn them into men and why we love the sport but ultimately like this story is about zach easter and uh he 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 was a really impressive young man the way that i i never met him 
I wrote a 300 page book about this guy. I never met him. Uh, the first time I ever heard about him was from his obituary. Uh, I had actually just moved up to Minneapolis and I was, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, steel town, football town. Um, and by the way, also the town where concussion took place, where uh, sort of a seminal city in th- th- this concussion epidemic that people are really actually paying attention to the past decade or more. Uh, but I was back home for Christmas. Uh, a friend passed on an obituary for the newspaper I used to work for in Des Moines. And he's like, you should check this out. Like, this is, a, this is something that might interest you. And I, mean, I remember exactly where I was, where I, read, where I read this. It was one of those handful of moments in your career that where everything just kind of stands still. And I remember that that very final paragraph of his obituary just absolutely hit me in my gut. Do you guys mind if I just read this to you? Cause this was, this was like what from that moment, it was like, I gotta tell this guy's story. He, he, here's what it said. This is next to this photograph of the smiling young man. And, and it's talking about how he just graduated from college He's on the honor roll. He was uh, voted Iowa Soldier of the Year in the Iowa National Guard. And he had just died and died by suicide. And, and the obituary was very blunt about it. And here's what it said. It said, Zach was a selfless person. His last wish was to make sure that no one else has to struggle from head trauma like he did. It is important to Zach to tell his story about CTE, a disease he attempted to manage for years. He suffered from severe migraines, brain tremors, slurred speech, blurred vision, and dementia, among other physical ailments. Mind you, this is a 24-year-old young man. Uh, He unselfishly is donating his brain along with a detailed diary that documented his life so that no one suffers the way that he did. He bravely fought the silent disease for years until he was no longer able. His spirit will always be with us. Zach asked that memorials be donated to the Concussion Legacy Foundation so that further research can be done on this disease. His final request is that people talk about CTE, support more research, and value knowledge. By the way, note that he doesn't say his final request is the football goes away. His final request is that we talk about this. Uh, so I, I read that, and, and I still knew people in Iowa had only moved away six months before. I ended up getting on the phone with Brenda Easter and Two weeks after Zach's death, I was sitting in their living room uh, with Brenda, his mom, uh, with his father, Miles, with one, with one of his two brothers, uh, with this girlfriend um, who, was, who was pivotal to, to his story and into this book, and with a couple of family friends. And we spent, I think it was four hours where I'm sitting on the living room floor, and we're just talking about Zach's life, talking about how concussions you know, by the way, he only played football through high school. He played football for nine or 10 years, uh, but concussions completely wrecked him and mismanagement of concussions completely wrecked him. And we're talking about all this. And this was like the moment that stuck with me. We're, we're, we're talking about this up on the, the wall. You see this 10 point buck that Zach had killed, uh, it had shot on the family's land his senior year of high school. This is like a traditional rural Iowa red state family. Uh, We're talking about all this. We're talking about him as a kid, him as a baby, uh, what he meant to his parents, the joy that he brought them, and this whole time. And we're talking about his downfall. The whole time that we're talking, we have a football game on the background. It's Packers-Vikings, last game of the regular season, 2015 season. Uh, And it was, you know, Packers was Zach's favorite team. Vikings were his dad's favorite team. His dad had taken over Zach's fantasy football team after his death. Uh, and to me, that was so, so striking, right? Like so symbolic of this tortured relationship that we as a people, that we as a country have with the sport. We, at, at this point, a decade ago, when Zach graduated from high school in 2010, we were barely starting to pay attention to the, these links between concussions and what they can really do to you. Now we know it, but we still watch football. You know, the Super Bowl still brings out 100 million people, to, 100 million Americans to watch it every year. It still is, even though we're a little bit worried about it. And like the numbers of kids playing high school football has gone down pretty steadily over the past decade. Not dramatically, but steadily. Um, we still love this sport as a country. And, but, but we recognize that there's something very, 
dangerous. There's something that we need to pay attention to uh, when it relates to the head. You can't, you, know, you break an arm and you go to the doctor and you get an x-ray and you'd be like, that is a broken arm. You need six weeks in a cast and then you can rehab and you can be back on the field in two months. Uh, with a broken brain, man, I, 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 I am amazed at doctors who, who, who work on this day in, day out because that is, has got to be the hardest part of medicine because there's not a scan that can tell you, hey, this guy just got a concussion or, hey, there's CTE developing. Hopefully, I mean, you guys would know way more about this than I would, but hopefully, you know, in the future, 10, 20 years from now, we can have things like sideline concussion tests, uh, whether it's, you know, a spit test that can show the enzymes that are released with a concussion or some brain scans that can show buildup of tau proteins. But those things are not around right now. But I do think like this cultural conversation is as important as the, probably more important than the, you know, let's have safer equipment. Let's make the rules of football a little bit safer. Let's, uh, let's push the science forward as much as we can. To me, I hope that's what Zach's story helps do. It's all about conversation. It's all about, let's pay attention to this sport. Instead of saying, you got your bell rung, let's say, hey, that's not just a concussion. That's a mild traumatic brain injury. Ooh, call it that. <laughs> and suddenly, parents are a little bit more, taken a little bit more seriously than if you just call it a concussion. Wow. I mean, he painted such a powerful picture. I mean, that must have been, what a moment to, to share with his family so short after um, he lost his life and they lost her son and, you know, partner and everything. Um, that must have been overwhelming and, and deeply honoring to, to be in that, that space with them. I, I'm so glad you used that word honoring because that's mm -hmm. what it was. It's, it's, it's a responsibility and I, I'm humbled that the family trusted me to tell his story. Uh, and, and look, the, what, what is the reason that this ever became anything is because Zach had foresight to write his experiences down. He left behind the, the, this thick ream of journals. He wrote, you could call it an autobiography, like a 38 page Microsoft Word document that he called Concussions, My Secrets, My Silent Struggle. Uh, his girlfriend gave me all these text messages. So, uh, text messages between the two as Zach was sort of going on this downward spiral. And look, suicide's terrible. And I think one of the reasons it's terrible is because people are always left asking why. Like, why did he do this? Why did she do this? Uh, couldn't they see how much we loved them? Uh, what Zach left his parents was, in a way, a blessing. He left them these writings that said, hey, this is why I did this and don't feel sorry for me. I don't blame you. I don't blame football, but I do want you to go out and share my story. How powerful is that to in the days after your sons or your brothers or, or, or your, your boyfriend's death by suicide, you have him saying, go tell your story, go tell my story, share this with the world. Uh, and the, responsibility that he gave his parents. I think they've really followed through with it. And it's, it's courageous because when I talk with Brenda Easter and Miles Easter, when I talk with his girlfriend, Allie Epperson, uh, I mean, we talked about some awful, awful stuff, right? Um, not just, Hey, he died. Um, but those months leading up to his death where he was just a roller coaster. And it wasn't this, like this steady, uh, descent to something that's awful. It was, it was an up and down thing. It was like one day he's like, I don't see why life's worth living. Uh, I'm going to do a bunch of cocaine and uh, maybe some ecstasy and definitely some Ritalin. And uh, a couple days later, he'll be, you know what? I, I, I need to get back. I, I can beat this thing. I'm going to go apply for a job at this restaurant. And I, I want to do, uh, I want to go to, Case Western Reserve University, where my girlfriend just went to law school. And I'm going to go to business school there. I'm going to be a millionaire. Here's my 20 step plan to be a millionaire. And three days later, he's like, "Fuck it, I'm done with this. I can't. Yeah, I can't live any longer." It is so painful to hear it in Zach's own words. It's also so powerful, and I think really 
distills what can be so scary about this disease and why we should take it so seriously. Wow. Man, you, you're, you're so good at telling the story. And um, I mean, I just can't help but think like the serendipity of you reading that uh, and then, and then <laughs> feeling that calling inside you to reach out to the family and make that, that interaction happen. And, and so you're, you're part of his legacy, which is, it's, it's amazing. David, go ahead. I know you got, you want to get some questions. No, this is just intense, man. I mean, uh, I'm kind of with, with Reed about, you know, there's no regrets me playing the game. I, this was some of the best years of my life, but you know, it's kind of like we have these blinders on to like, we know these risks. I mean, we kind of all know that when we get into this sport, especially as we get older and I'm sure that Zach knew it too. I mean, he knew what the risk of playing football was and, and, and some of these things. But I think the bigger thing right now is like, even though we're aware of these things, like you're saying, there should be protocols in place to address these types of problems. Cause I love the way you just talked. I mean, you have a broken bone, we can take an x-ray, we can, you know, address it and fix it and put you back. But the brain is a completely different completely different thing that needs to be assessed and then monitored post injury to see if you had an injury because you know i've seen i I work with a lot of brain trauma in my clinic and i see a lot of kids that have concussive trauma and then they're they're on to the next week and they're playing in the game again (sighs) and it's not and it's not being properly assessed it's not being it's not being giving its weight even by the coaches and the trainers and things like that, of the dangers of going and stepping onto that field again. I remember I had a kid come in and we assessed him with concussive trauma and I ended up talking to him and his parents and told him like, he can't play. And they just kind of looked at me like that wasn't even an answer that they were going to even bother listening to that he needed to play the next week. And it's almost like we're not giving it the weight. And it's, and I, I, you know, I read something in one of these emails we exchanged with you, brother, with this cognitive dissonance, right? It's like, <laughs> it's there, we know it, but we have this, like, this obsession with this game that we just are willing to overlook these things. It's the football industrial complex, right? It is like oh, wormed its way into our mind. And, and by the way, like I say, this is a guy who, maybe this makes me a hypocrite, but I'm still a especially NFL. I'm still a big NFL fan. It's my favorite sport, uh, favorite sport to watch. Um, never, never played it at a competitive level. Um, but yeah, I mean, every Sunday I'm down there in my basement watching the Vikings lose uh, every Sunday in the fall with my five-year-old kid. Um, you, you, you bring up parents and that, that's so sad. Cause like you guys know this as doctors, the absolute worst thing that you can have after a concussion is another concussion, right? Like, uh, these things can be managed, but, uh, and I don't, I don't think the message should be like, parents don't let your kid play football. It should be parents. If you want to let your kid play football, keep an eagle eye on your kid. And if there are you know, evidence of a concussion, you know, no, don't just pump the brakes, like slam on the brakes and like stop. And that is, uh, you know, that's, that's absolutely number one. And if you, if you look at the way, th- the way things are now, you compare it to a decade ago, I think, I would assume that the incidence of parents who don't take things seriously now compared to a decade ago, compared to before Junior Seau died by suicide, which to me, that is like the, the tipping point, the seminal moment where we had been talking about this and there were news stories in the New York times and GQ magazine, but that was the one where it's like, this guy was superhuman. And then you realize he was a broken, completely broken man. Um, Junior say was a hero to so many people. And then to hear the way that his life had just completely unraveled and ended tragically that, that I think really shook people more than any other of these high profile football deaths. Uh, and there, there, there was a moment. There, there was a moment last NFL season that I thought distilled to me how things have changed culturally in this conversation. It was during NFL divisional playoff weekend, and it was Saturday and Sunday. 
uh, Ravens were playing on Saturday. Chiefs were playing on Sunday. Chiefs, Browns, I forget who the Ravens were playing. Uh, Bills, I think. And in the Ravens game, Lamar Jackson knocked out with a concussion, did not come back into the game. In the Chiefs game, Patrick Mahomes knocked out with a concussion, did not come back into the game. What was remarkable to me about that, and I think was different from a decade ago, you know, these players, I'd say two most exciting players in the NFL, the two most recent MVPs of the league. Uh, the moment that each of these guys hit their heads and came up woozy, the announcers were like, whoa. And the fans were like, whoa. And the players were like, oh, no. And you knew that guy wasn't coming back into the game. There's going to be no forcing. It doesn't matter that it was a playoff game, that it was like, you know, one or done. Like, you win this game or your season's over. It didn't matter. It, you don't have the coach saying, oh, come on, Lamar, you got to get back in the game. We got to win this. You had the independent neurological consultant on the sideline saying, nope, he's not going back in. That is so different from a decade ago. And I think when you look at that cultural shift, I do think, at least I hope, that people look at this injury different than other injuries, look at it differently than a decade ago. I know that's not all the way across the board, but if you look at Zach Easter's high school, uh, the, the trainer who had started a few years before Zach started playing football, when she came in, she was battling. She was very concussion aware. Frankly, like before the rest of society was, this woman named Sue Wilson was paying attention to concussions. And she would take players' helmets during a game and say, you're not going back in. And when she'd do that, the fans would boo her. She'd have a uh, a, a local town doctor who complained to the athletic director, I mean, what are her credentials to, to not let my son back in the game? Uh, it, it, when you look back on it, it's crazy. I do think the culture has started to change. But when you talk about stories like that, where parents can be like, hey, he got hit in the head. He's got to play this this Friday. He looks he looks OK. It's uh that to me is like dereliction of parenting duty, to be completely honest. Like that's shocking and awful. And it's like, when I look at Brenda and Miles Easter, they had the excuse that we didn't know in 2006. We didn't know in 2009. We know now there's no excuse that parents can give now for that. That's a powerful message to parents and, and to coaches and anyone involved in the sport, you know, and not just football, you know, here in Canada, sure. we've got, we've got it under our skin and it's hockey and, you know, rugby across the pond. I mean, there's so many soccer, you know, football, uh, European football. I mean, there's lots of different, you know, situations where we have to take a, a better, a closer look in the mirror, but I loved how you brought up the game from, from that last season and to see that evolution in, in our attention to, to these details, which are so important. I, I'm curious. I would love to take it back to, to Zach for a moment. You brought up some really interesting stuff with regards to how he was coping. And, you know, this is a common thing where people move into an addiction or, or use uh, abuse, abuse, drugs, alcohol. I mean, you see it all the time with a lot of these different professional athletes that do something to numb their pain, calm down the headaches, get out of the reality of this depressive horrible state that they feel in their body and their mind um could you could you highlight a little bit of uh some of zach's journey and and then along with the self-medication maybe what are some of the things that maybe he highlighted that did add value to his process yeah i mean zach uh look he had boatloads of concussions um this goes back to to middle school documented concussions uh from football and other places like there's it was sort of like the fall off your bike type concussions. He was in a car accident after high school, uh, got a concussion from there. I mean, as you guys know, once you get one concussion, you're more susceptible to other ones. But there were, you know, his, his senior year uh, where he was just amped up to go play football as a senior. His older brother is in the high school athletic hall of fame, went on to play uh, college football uh, is sort of following in his dad's football his footsteps. His dad was a division one college football player. Um, and this was like Zach's chance in the sun, right? Like he was a captain and he was so amped up for his senior year. And then he goes to a camp in August down in Missouri. Boom, gets a concussion. One of those big hits that like the whole camp stops. It's like, whoa, what just happened? 
Uh, Zach was done for that camp. I mean, they did the right thing. They pulled him out. Um, checks out with a doctor. Um, t- takes some rest time. And then he's back in at the beginning of the season. Uh, very early in the season. Gets another concussion. Same thing. Uh, family did the right thing. Sent him to a doctor. He lied to the doctor. He lied his way out of it. But he, he didn't play for the next, I think, two or three weeks. Uh, goes back in for a game in, in middle, I believe it's mid-October, uh, against their arch rival. It was like this uh, this rich, snooty high school, uh, suburban high school. And they were, you know, this the, this the place that Zach was from was like this small town that sort of had its chip on its shoulder. And the whole school was just amped up for this game. This was Zach's first game back. He was super excited. His trainer, I mentioned Sue Wilson, was incredibly nervous. She wasn't sure that he should be playing, but he got cleared by a doctor. What could she do? And then in that game, I think it was in the third quarter, he had a head-to-head hit and comes back to the sideline, and he's woozy, and he's got, uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but Sasadis, or his eyes are kind of going all over the place. Psychotic movement, yeah. His eyes are all over the place. He's dizzy. He looks like he's going to throw up. Um, his trainer takes his helmet and says, you're done, Zach. And he just put his head in his hands. And then you can see him, you know, I, I watched game tape from that night. His coach gave him, gave me the game tape and you can see Zach later in that game, trailing the trainer, trying to get his helmet back. He wants to go back in the hold that this sport had on, on him was so deep. And then after that, he did, does not go back. That was his last football game. His trainer would not clear him to go into wrestling. He had some choice words for her when she told him that. Um, but, but, you know, Zach that year uh, it was when he really went down to the dumps. The, the only highlight that he had of his senior year when he, when he got that 10 point buck uh, out in his family's land that winter, other than that, you know, you expect your senior year, you're having fun, you're partying. Zach was in the basement uh, in the dark. It was uh, things got really dark for him. And, continued that way you know goes to college parties his ass off flunks out like a lot of us do uh moves back in with his parents goes into community college joins the national guard and this whole time he's having these sort of flirtations with drug and alcohol abuse um that were all just one one more way that he could try to mask his pain and insecurity from all the issues that he was having uh, after his concussions. Uh, He'd talk about things like going to the hardware store to buy his dad a Father's Day gift and wandering around the store for 20 minutes, lost, forgetting why he was there. He'd talk about driving back from Des Moines to to Indianola and getting lost on the way. It was a drive that he'd made hundreds of times before. Uh, People could kind of notice some of this slurred speaking and I think his, his parents were absolutely concerned with him. But you know what? When I was in late teens, early 20s, I was an idiot too. <laughs> you know, I didn't have post-concussion syndrome. I just had like age 21 syndrome. And I think that's what his parents uh, wrote it off as. Is like, yeah, Zach's partying too much, but he's just trying to find his way. I think that's probably what I'd do as a parent too until on his 24th birthday, uh, June 2015, six months before he died, he his parents took him to dinner. Uh, Zach and his cousin, who really he's really close friends with, and he's like, "Guys, I need to tell you something. I think I have this thing CTE that Mike Webster has." And his dad thought he was full of shit at first. To be completely honest, he was like, "I don't think that's a real thing. I had plenty of concussions when I played football. I'm fine now." Uh, he thought. And I think a lot of people thought when, when they heard about players like Andre Waters or Dave Dewars and all these like, you know, millionaire athletes who died by suicide in their forties or fifties, he thought they just couldn't deal with not being in the spotlight anymore. Um, he, he didn't think this was a real thing. And then over time he started to realize it. And I think what really made him realize it was in November it was Zach's first suicide attempt and it was very public. Uh, he, you know, police arrived and had to talk him down. And, you know, it's the prologue of my book. Uh, Zach's dad arrives and essentially like 
has to take the gun out of his hand and say, don't do this. Um, that was the holy shit moment for this family and really put them into gear. But at that point, uh, I think Zach had sort of lost hope. And w- one of the messages that I would hope that people um, would take from this book is that, and it can be hard within Zach's story to get this message because he got to a point where he did not believe he could live anymore. But I, I, I think part of this, part of the message needs to be, hey, look, this is an awful disease. The stuff that comes from concussions later in life can be really insidious, but there can still be hope and there should still be hope. Uh, science is always moving forward on this. Uh, Zach made things worse. I know it's a chicken and egg type thing, but he made things worse with his, with his drug abuse, with his drinking. Uh, you almost can't separate those two things because uh, he was, he, he, he was drinking to hide his post-concussion stuff and then it would make it worse. It was just this, this nasty stew and you throw in some, some mental illness stuff that's all made so much worse by drinking, by drugs, by, by, by this incipient CD, CTE that's happening in his head. Um, but I, I, And you guys would be able to speak to this, I think, better, way better than I would. But I think there should be a message of hope here that, look, CTE is a degenerative disease. It's also one that can be managed. And that was, I think if there's one hero in this book, it's Zach's girlfriend, Allie. She's the only person he told all of this to. He felt very embarrassed uh, about what he was going through. But her message to him was like, you know what? You may not have the same life that you would have had if you hadn't had these concussions, but you can still live a happy, productive, if different life uh, with these. And, uh, that, that, that is what I would hope anyone who's dealing with uh, post-concussion syndrome, CTE, uh, any, any sort of concussion-related later-in-life uh, symptoms would take from this is don't lose hope. Like There, is, there are things that can be done about this. Uh, and in fact, I think it starts with just leading a healthy lifestyle is, is first and foremost. Beautiful, man. Uh, yeah. You know, as you're as you're saying that, Reed, I'm thinking like that's been a big fear of mine, right? Like I had some pretty, you know, I had about seven over my career, but in college I had some heavy concussions. And one of the big things since I've gotten out of school is just like addressing my brain. And I've been working for decades on this stuff because I know there's been trauma there. I know there's been damage there. And what you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, it starts with just living a healthy lifestyle and taking really good care of yourself. And then there's a, there's an onslaught of other things now that we know, like you're saying with science that can be done to start helping you create healing in the brain from this chronic, like you're saying, degenerative disease. But there, there are answers. There are things that are there, but it's sad to hear Zach's story because he, like you said, he got into this place where he just completely lost hope probably because of how bad his daily experience was on a daily basis to where, I mean, it, I'm trying to put myself in his shoes, man, but it's like, it had to have been really, really freaking bad for him to, to want to take his life to the point where he just said, no, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm going to just have to say, hey, use me as this example and take my brain and donate it to science and do what you need to do, but don't let this happen to anybody else. And, and, it, and you know, you want to, I don't see any, it's hard. It's just a hard thing to think about and talk about, man. But there is a concern there, and I, and I know it's. I'm not just speaking for myself. There's probably thousands and thousands of other athletes and people that have played sports that have concussive damage that probably have the same worries and fears. But I'm glad that you're speaking to this, man, because they do need to hear that message. Like, if you haven't already been addressing it and doing things, then now's the time to start. And it's harder. Like if you're dealing with these issues, it's harder to live a healthy lifestyle when you want to d- disappear in the bottle, uh, when you want to just like numb your pain with whatever you can get your hands on, when you want to lose hope. Like, I don't think there's any denying that, that like it, it will become harder to live that healthy lifestyle. But, you know, think of what would your high school football coach have said, right? Dig in, man. Like life's tough. Uh, this is your new challenge. And I think that's, that should be the message. Like if we, if we talk about like men being tough, right? Like that's how we get to this point is that we try to battle through the injuries. That's the, 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 there's a, 
badge of courage and battling through injuries. Well, this is your new badge of courage. Battle through this injury, but do it in a way that is uh, healthy and productive. And uh, it's not easy. You know, me sitting here saying that as someone who I may have had one or two concussions in my life, but they were freak concussions. They weren't like, uh, I think with football, like concussions are to some extent baked into the sport. Um, in a way that I, I, I think in, in, in lots of other sports, like you bring up hockey and rugby, I think concussions are somewhat baked into those sports. Um, but, you know, if you get a concussion in track and field or even basketball, it's sort of a freak injury. Um, but look, it's, it, it's easy if you haven't had concussions to be like, hey, man, just, just be healthy, you know? Um, it's harder when you've dealt with that stuff. Uh, I mean, I, not, not to turn the table, but like I want to ask the doctors, like it, if I came in, Zach Easter at age 24, I'm struggling with this stuff. Uh, and I'm just, you know, I know advice number one is like, hey man, stop drinking, stop the drugs, get into rehab if you have to. But then advice number two, like living that healthy lifestyle, like what, I'm curious, what what is the advice there? Because it does become a little bit more difficult when you have these symptoms that you're dealing with. Yeah, I think that's that's an important, you know, place to, to take this conversation. And, you know, when I think of uh, Zach's story, I think of, you know, all the little things that, you know, now maybe parents can do to, to look out for the signs and symptoms, but also, you know, what we know with some of these injuries is that it doesn't, the number of in head injuries doesn't even matter. You know, as Dr. Mark Gordon said on the podcast, you can have a head injury 15 years ago that now you're manifesting symptoms of, and it's just, there's a storm brewing in the body. And the depth of that storm or when it manifests could be different for each person. So, you know, to your point, we make bad decisions when our brain's inflamed. So telling someone to eat a good diet when they're, when they're, you know, in such a mess is, is sometimes not the easiest way forward. So, you know, personally, what we do here in our clinic, you know, when people are that bottomed out, we just, we flood them with nutrition, with IV therapy. We just get their, Hmm. we build up the vitamin C levels in the blood, which is one of your most potent anti-inflammatories. It can circulate in the brain. Sometimes we take the pressure off of the therapies, right? So hyperbaric, maybe it's some saunas, anything to help bring down the inflammation in the body. So we start, you know, being a place where a biochemistry can match a desire to start eating better and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we, we do have brain map technology here. We do neurofeedback and all those other things. Um, and a lot of these therapeutics are going to be sort of, you know, one, two steps forward, maybe one step back because we haven't yet filled in the gaps in nutrition. Um, and then, uh, you know, Dave, Dave can speak too on what he does as well. Um, but another core one that we do is, is hormones and, and look at the hormonal profile, because with any head injury, growth hormone is going to drop, testosterone. A lot of our potent anti-inflammatory hormones really get, you know, severely um, depleted. And, you know, you brought up the, the drugs, the alcohol, other things that really start to spike insulin in the body, which, which basically propagates more inflammation. So, you know, to say that there's one way forward, there obviously isn't. Um, and chiropractic care is huge too, right, Dave? I mean, like, talk about that and uh, like the nervous system and... You know, well, Nick painted the, yeah, Nick painted the picture very well. The only thing I would add to that is just removing interference to the, to the nervous system and the brain. So, you know, I do some brain work with a technique called neurological integration. So that's just helping doing some brain mapping to make connections with the body. And then, of course, chiropractic, <laughs> ther- you know, chiropractic adjustments, you know, the cervical spine plays this huge role uh, and really just that massive amount of information that has to feed down from the brain to our body all day. So if we have problems there, and if you've had concussive trauma, you have issues with your spine. Yeah. There's those aren't separate from each other. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of things, but like Nick saying, it's kind of where you're taking the baseline of where the person's starting, what that lifestyle has looked like, you know, since some of these traumas, and then you got to take them from, that red zone sometimes and then move them progressively to stabilize them. And then, okay, here's long-term what you need to do to take care of this, you know, so that we, this doesn't progress and continually get worse. Cause like you're saying, it is a degenerative problem, but if you're doing all the right things and you can get to that place, there is a lot of hope for you. Like you're saying of living a a, a good life still. I mean, yes, you are going to have an injury. Yes. You may still have some, upstream battles but they're going to be to a much lesser degree than if you're just like you know not even paying any kind of attention or awareness to your problem and just letting you know nature run its course 
I love I love the podcast that you guys did with Dr. Mark Gordon and and the the, the thing that he, he made this great analogy in there um, it, because I think we think about concussions as oh my gosh it's, it's that big hit right mm-hmm. and he's like sometimes it's a dollar but sometimes it's ten dimes right that mm-hmm. equal one dollar and to me and, and this is a, a little bit of a swerve from what we were just talking about but, but kind of going back to football like the future of football um, to me that those big concussions can be managed like you, you'll have the occasional free kit um, but like generally speaking from NFL all the way down to Pop Warner, uh, they've done a good job of trying to take the head out of the game as much as possible. But it's those sub-concussive hits that, that, that really worry me long-term for the future of football, where it's like, you know, alignment is going to have some level of head contact on just about every play. Uh, it's not going to rise to the level of a concussion, but if you hit smack heads, uh, you know, 50 times a game, 60 times a game with another player, and you play 16, so now 17 games a year in the NFL. They do that for 10 years. Um, what, is, what does that mean long term? And to me, like, that's the biggest worry. Like, that's the biggest unknown. As, as a parent and as a, as a player, that's the part that would that freak me out the most. It wouldn't be so much those big concussions, although those are, those are terrifying when they happen. I think that the, I, I think. They are less than they were a decade ago. Uh, and the numbers that the NFL sends out bear, bear that out. It's the, the sub-concussive hits that, to me, could be an existential question for the future of, of the NFL and of football in general. No, and I appreciate you bringing that up, man, because even that movie, uh, the guy that played for the Steelers, what's his name? Mike, Mark, Mike Webster, Mike, yeah. Mike Webster. He was in the trenches, man. He, yeah. was, he was a lineman, right? So yeah. you're, you're painting that picture of these sub-concussive things. I mean, that guy was hitting like multiple, I mean, probably 50, 60 times a game. for like, Every single play. Every single play, man. Yeah, and like one of the things I always tell people is a lot of times when you're watching, some of those big hits actually don't, they don't hurt as much or you don't feel as much as the person on the field as the ones that don't look like they're that serious. So, so weird, some of the right? ones that just you guys watch on the field, and you're like, "Oh, that wasn't a big deal." Those actually hurt a whole lot more sometimes than the ones that look like, "Oh, that guy got leveled out on the playing field. He got his bell run right." And that one sometimes isn't as bad. You it's know, like the I awkward. Had, sometimes the awkward hits, right? The odd yeah. angle hits. Yeah. yeah, and it's like nobody's paying attention to it, but that's the one yeah. that did the damage, like you're saying. So, absolutely, man, and that's important, I, I think, for parents to understand too. It's not these big ones. It's like how many how many times a game is your kid having yeah. this repetitive, you know, trauma and repetitive uh, impact. So are you going to let Diego play football if he really wants to? If he comes up to you and says, "Dad, I'm 14. Or, or, I want to try out for the team." You know, man. When I when my wife was pregnant, that was probably one of the main things that was going through <laughs> my head is like, am I going to let my child play football because it was such a big part of my life. And I don't have any regrets playing, man. Like yeah. none whatsoever. I mean, you, you the guy we were talking about earlier where we get concussions, but then we still want to get in the game. And that was me. Right. Absolutely. Like, I was a different person on the field. And it's funny looking back on it now, thinking like, holy crap, David, like you just had a concussion and your dumbass was trying to get right back in the game. But I thought long and hard for a really long time about Diego, man. And I, I just told myself, I said, like, there's so many things he can get out of football. And part of me, like with you, is like, well, maybe he can get that from other sports. And I agree with you. I don't think he can. And I'm still in agreement with you on that. There's just another beast about football that you can't get in other sports. Yeah. But at the same time with what I've been through, I I just got to say, no, man. Like, it's just one of those things where I think he can live without it. And I think he'll be better off just long term, just without it. I just got to find other ways to help him build those skills that I want to have instilled in growing up, but without doing it where, you know, yeah. he's at risk with some of these things. And hey, that's, uh, that's largely because I work with the brain all day, man. And I see all kinds right. of stuff now. Yeah. And so even now, like, you know, when I was a kid and I was younger, I would have given you a different answer if I had Diego. But now that I'm almost 40, and I know what I know, and I've seen what I've seen. I can't consciously say like, "Yeah, I'm okay playing this sport anymore." The the doctor who plays a, a 
who plays who who is a significant character in this book. His name's Sean Spooner. He's a doctor uh, outside Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, he, he's the one who was the Navy doctor who did the concussion uh, uh, rehabilitation center in Afghanistan. And a year, I mean, like a year and a half ago, it was before the hardcover version of this book came out. Uh, I was talking with him like, so you have a, you have a kid who's, I think it was, you know, two or three years older than my older son. My older son's about to turn nine. So I think Spooner's kid is maybe 12 now. And his kid wanted to play football. And Dr. Spooner had played football uh, in high school himself. Uh, it was a terrible team in a small town. And he wasn't a good football player. And he said it was the best times of his life. And his son's like, I want to play football, dad. And he was torn about it. He didn't, he didn't know what to do. And he, what, he did, what, what he decided to do was... He presented his son with all the evidence. Uh, he's like, here's what can happen. Here are the risks of concussion in football. And he's like, you can make the choice. And his son ended up choosing soccer instead, which there are, there are, there are uh, certainly concussions can happen in soccer, especially with headers, uh, but uh, not nearly what they have with football. But I thought it was interesting that he let his son make that decision. Mm -hmm. I... I, my, my older kid doesn't like football. My my younger kid is five years old and will go down and watch uh, football. And he has this, you know, we'll watch NFL on, on Sunday. Um, he has that sort of Zach Easter mentality where he'll just like throw himself into situations, you know, devil may care attitude. And my wife and I, when we talk about it now, I mean, I may not have a, uh, a voice in the matter 10 years from now because my wife's pretty dead set against it. We talk about it now. And we're like, no, we're not going to let him play football. I do think it it does become a slightly different discussion when your kid's 14 years old and he's like, all oh, my friends are going out for it. And we go watch this sport every weekend in the fall with my dad. And it's a bonding thing. And there's all this meaning to football. Um, I think it does become a more difficult nuanced discussion when they get of that age. Uh, but I, I would presume, you know, 10 years from now, I'll, I'll end up landing in that same spot that, that you've landed at, but uh, we'll see. I mean, if, if science figures this out, get on it, science, come on, <laughs> <laughs> come on, science. <laughs> uh, was, and I've had those conversations with my wife, man. I, I you know, I, when we were initially talking about that, I was like, well, they have skull caps now and like we can yeah. assess them after his games. And like, I was like, we just know more. And at least we know going into it. I was like, I know better now yeah. than I did when I played. And he's at least got that going for him. If he yeah, for sure. he's a little older, like, Hey dad, I really want to do this. And then like you're saying, that may be a different conversation as he grows up a little bit and if things change, but um, I think the bigger thing there, Reed is, we have awareness now and we're paying attention. That's it. It's the most and, important part, right? And we weren't before, right? Like a decade ago, we just weren't. It was just something that was just being kind of swept under the rug, but it's huge, man. And, and you know, you, you writing this book and telling Zach's story is just bringing more and more of that awareness that everybody needs. I think that if there's one dying wish that Zach Easer had, I mean, that's it right there. Right. Uh, his final request is that people talk about CTE, support more research and value knowledge. You know, the final words of his obituary, it's stuff that he said in his journals again and again and again. So I progress has been made and it will continue to be made in this really difficult, nuanced, uh, emotionally charged topic. And, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a that's a perfect ending to the story, buddy. I mean, you you painted such a beautiful picture of the game, the the love, the the tradition, um, how we get enraptured by the experience, all of us collectively, those who are playing it, and just all these details that that we also need to shine light on and bring awareness to. So, thank you so much. Um, love Zach is the book. It's going to be released on September 7th. Um, where can people get it? How do, how, do, how do people follow you? And obviously you're so articulate with the way, and your storytelling is just beautiful. And so I'm sure people are going to want to follow you and, and see what else <laughs> you're creating as well. So uh, please, please share where, where people can access yeah. everything. I mean, get, get, get the book anywhere, uh, Amazon, or if you want to support your local independent bookstore, most of them can get the book. Um, it's also, there's an audio book too. Nice. Um, so are you, are you doing that? Are you doing the audio? 
you know, I wanted to. And you I got the voice for it, like, man. I, well, it's funny. It, 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 I was like, oh, I can do this. And then my publisher was like, eh, you know, we have some, uh, we have some like professional actors who do this. And then I listened to the guy who did it, and, and he's remarkable. Like, like I, I can't even make it through like the Lorax reading it to my kid doing the same voice for each character. This guy has the same voice for each character when he's quoting him. He's wow. so good. Uh, the, the audiobook's fantastic, and it is not my voice, although I would have loved to do it. Uh, I'm glad that I didn't. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm on Twitter, although I, I think Twitter is a, a poisonous cesspool, and I, I don't uh, go on it as much as I used to. Uh, but it's just at Reed Forgrave. And uh, yeah, I got a website, just readforgrave.com. And if anyone has any questions uh, or, or even wants to connect with, uh, with, with characters in the book, uh, my email's on the website. Feel free to reach out. Yeah, Reed, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious, did, did the parents, um, did they, they leave a, or do they kind of working on a fund or are they, what are they, what are they working on as far as like I'm, getting the education out there? I am embarrassed. I didn't uh, mention this. They started a foundation in Zach's honor uh, uh -huh. after his death. It's called the CTE Hope Foundation. And if you Google CTE Hope, uh, I believe it's CTE-hope.com. Um, but I, you know what? I should look that up. I shouldn't just say that and, and say it wrong. But uh, it, it, and it's an organization. They do a gala every year. Obviously, last year got got canceled for uh, 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 what's that thing that's going around? What's the disease <laughs> I don't know. Called? I forgot. I, I forgot. Uh, so yeah. so focus on CTE. Yeah. Um, yes, it's CTE dot, uh, CTE hope dot com, and it does basically it, it, it tries to fund uh, smart scientific research to uh, to combat uh this issue uh the the main thing that brenda easter has in her mind is this sideline saliva test where mm. she's been working with drake university iowa state university uh some local high schools athletic association in iowa uh to fund some research on uh trying to figure out those biomarkers in saliva uh that can say hey this guy just got a concussion he's out of the game uh and be able to do it in minutes uh that would be it doesn't change everything, but I think it would that would be a significant scientific hurdle to be able to do that. Uh, so they do really good work, and uh, I would uh, it's a great website. They have all sorts of resources as well. I would encourage anyone to reach out to that. Amazing. And Amazing. I'll add it in the show notes when we post the episode for sure. Yeah. Reed, thank you so much, man. Uh, I love that you answered that call to, to go see his parents and, and, you know, go into a really uncomfortable situation. And, you know, obviously what, what birthed as a result of you taking action is, uh, is you know, like it's literally a legacy for the family and, and for all those playing sport that, and parents that decide to pick up the book and learn more. I, it's just so important. So thank you so much. Thanks. And it was, that's really what it was. It was a calling. Uh, there have only been a handful of times in my career that I've, that I've felt that way about a story. So I hope your, uh, your listeners pick up the book and, and spread Zach's uh, legacy because I think it's a powerful one. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Reed. Appreciate you, man. Thanks. This is great. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.